Welcome back to this edition of Criminal Mischief, the Art and Science of Crime Fiction. I'm D.P. Lyle. Today I want to talk about DNA. I want to talk about some famous and some odd cases of DNA uh, analysis, and I hope that um, many of these stories will help you um, craft your own fiction uh, using some of these techniques. And I will say that the whole subject of DNA uh, evaluation is found in both of my books, Forensics for Dummies and How Done It Forensics, if you want to get into the details of that. And some of these cases are also there that we're going to talk about. But what I want to do is cover a few cases that kind of give you a flavor for how DNA became what it is, number one, and number two, some odd uses for it. Um, some places it's found where you might not expect. But let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the famous Colin Pitchfork case. Uh, this happened, uh, it began in 1983, uh, when a 15-year-old girl named Linda Mann was walking on a path near her home in, uh, in England and never showed up at home. Her body was found. She had been raped and, and strangled uh, and left in some shrubbery, and the autopsy semen samples were, were obtained from her body. Remember, there was no DNA in 1983, but there was blood typing, and that could help at least eliminate some suspects and point fingers toward others. But there were, no suspect was um, found, and therefore the case kind of went cold. And you flash forward about three years to 1986, when another 15-year-old girl, uh, Dawn Ashworth, was found raped and beaten and strangled in a very similar fashion and not too far away, and her body was found in a wooded area two days after the event. Again, a semen sample was obtained. The police then developed a, a suspect, a 17-year-old boy named Richard Berkland, and he seemed to have knowledge at least about Don, Don Ashworth's body. Uh, so there was some suspicions there. Well, the police knew that recently, just a few years earlier, because now we're looking at 1986, 87, um, at the University of Leicester, a fellow by the name of Alec Jeffries, now known as Sir Alec Jeffries for, for obvious reasons, developed this new technique known as DNA fingerprinting. And we all know about it now, but this is where it came from. Well, they took Berkland's DNA and tested it against the two crime scene samples, and it didn't match. So Berkland was let off the hook. Now what to do? What they decided was to test everybody in the neighborhood. And they had over 5,000 local men uh, came in and gave blood and saliva samples. And they tested and tested and tested. And after six months and thousands of samples, they found nothing. No matches. Well, did this mean that the killer was from somewhere else and just passing through? Seems odd that three years apart in similar locations, uh, these murders would occur, but it's possible, I guess. So then they got a, a break happened. A guy named Ian Kelly was overheard in a bar bragging about he got paid uh, 200 pounds to give a DNA sample for one of his friends. Really? Well, his friend happened to be uh, Colin Pitchfork. Well, in 1987, Pitchfork was arrested. Uh, the DNA analysis was done, and it matched. And he became the first killer to be prosecuted on DNA evidence. And so this was earth-shaking for the, the DNA world and for the world of forensic science. Huge, obviously. And, of course, it changed everything going forward. So now let's look to the first case in the United States. Timothy Wilson Spencer, also known as the Southside Strangler. He was a serial killer who committed uh, three rapes and murders in the Richmond, Virginia and Arlington, Virginia areas uh, in the fall and winter of 1987. And he perhaps committed another murder as early as 1984, for which a man named David Vasquez was convicted and was sitting in jail. Spencer became the first serial killer in the United States to be convicted on the basis of DNA evidence. It started in September of 1987 when a, a woman named Debbie Dudley Davis, 35 years old, was uh, raped and murdered in her uh, 
apartment. She was killed by ligature strangulation. And then Dr. Susan Hellams, who was a resident in neurosurgery at the Medical College of Virginia, uh, just a few weeks later, was found again strangled uh, by ligature in, in her home. She was found by her husband. Um, the, the killer apparently came through a window screen uh, and, and gained access to their home at that time. And then you flash forward uh, a couple of months to, to late November when a, a student uh, near Richmond, a 15-year-old high school student, was raped and strangled in a very similar fashion. Spencer's final victim was Susan Tucker, and she was a 44-year-old lady who was, who was raped and murdered in her condominium, and this was in late November, around Thanksgiving time or a little after. Her body was not found until December the 1st, but this is when he was finally dubbed the Southside Strangler. The police started investigating, and they focused on Timothy Wilson Spencer, who was a 25-year-old kid. And... He was found to have traveled between Arlington uh, and and Richmond, and the timeline seemed to fit. He had gone to visit his mother um, for Thanksgiving, and the Tucker home was very close to that. So he was arrested on suspicion of these murders, and DNA was obtained. And it was found that uh, his DNA matched that in the Tucker, Davis, and Hellams murders. Um, and also, the DNA linked him to the 1984 murder of Carol Ham. This is the one that David Vasquez was sitting in prison for. So, to make a long story short, the Southside Strangler, Timothy uh, Spencer, was, con was the first person in the United States convicted by DNA evidence and David Vasquez was the first person acquitted by DNA evidence. That's pretty cool. So it shows that DNA can do both. It can convict and it can, it can ex exonerate. And that's, that's what it's all about. A very famous case from back in 1993 was known as the Brown's Chicken Massacre. This happened in Palatine, Illinois, which is uh, close to... Um, um, uh, Chicago. Uh, police found seven bodies in a walk-in refrigerator in this chicken restaurant. They were the employees of the restaurant. It was uh, late at night, early in the morning, and $2,000 was missing. So a manhunt followed, but nothing ever came of it. For nine years, they looked for who would have come in. They basically took these people, put them into the freezer, uh, put them down on the floor and shot them in the back of the head, execution style. So it was obviously a very horrendous crime, and the police were very frustrated with nine years of knowing nothing. But then a former girlfriend of a guy named James, James Degorski came forward and said that James and his buddy Juan Luna were the ones that did it. And she knew that because they told them and told her apparently. Well, this reopened the investigation and gave it a focus. And to make a long story short, Luna had worked at the restaurant at some time. So they came in and at the original crime scene, they had taken uh, a, a, the leftovers of a meal on a table and had saved it and done DNA off the chicken that was left there. Well, now when they arrest Degorski and Luna, they find out that the DNA matched um, and therefore proved that they had been there at the scene. Well, finally, uh, Luna confessed, and he basically said that they came in near closing time. They were waiting for the residual customers to leave so they could rob the place, and they decided they would have something to eat, so they had a chicken, chicken dinner, and then they herded the employees into the freezer and killed them. Uh, where well, they left behind the gnawed chicken bones, which had their saliva on them, which had their DNA on them. And so the case was solved on that. So this is the Brown's Chicken Massacre. It's a very famous, very famous case.
Now let's shift gears. We've been looking at nuclear DNA and DNA profiling and all the things that you, you read about when you get a DNA match. But what about familial DNA, the DNA that runs in your family? Remember, we all share 98% of our DNA with uh, with all the other primates, you know, chimpanzees and gorillas and, and things like that, the higher primates, so, which might explain a lot of human behavior. But it's the other 2% that where the devil's in the details. And your relatives, uh, you know, your, your siblings, your parents, your grandparents, your, your close, close relatives have even mo- more similar DNA with you than you would have with someone on the other side of the world. Uh, so DNA analysis does cluster around families for obvious reasons. Well, in Los Angeles, uh, murders started happening and they, they happened for quite a, quite a while, a number of years, um, where women were, were raped and battered and, and, and it went on and then it stopped. And nothing happened for about 14 years from 1988 to 2002. I think the first case was like 1985. So 85 to 88, a lot happened. Then nothing happened for that 14 years between 88 and 2002. And then the activity started back up again. And it, for this reason, the killer was dubbed the grim sleeper because he went to sleep for 14 years. Now, this is not unheard of btk uh also did the same thing and you can look up that if you want to read more about him um so it turns out that that they focused on a guy named lonnie franklin because he had been charged with theft and assaults and batteries and stuff in the in the past and all of that but but they didn't they couldn't prove it so they they looked they took the dna from the cases they put it into the system and they couldn't find anybody so they decided to expand their search and start looking for people with similar dna dna that might show some familial relationship um and sure enough they they found one and the person that they found happened to be lonnie's son And so they came to Christopher, the son, and obtained DNA from him, and sure enough, proved that. So now they had to get DNA from Lonnie. If they suspected he was the killer, but familial DNA is not tight enough uh, to, to, to make that provable. So they needed his DNA to compare with the crime scene samples. Well, I... He went to a birthday party that was at a restaurant, and he ate pizza. Well, they had an undercover officer in there who pretended to be a waiter at the restaurant, and he collected all the dishes and everything. Well, he also collected Lonnie's dishes, forks and glasses, and pizza crust. And from that, they obtained the DNA, and Lonnie Franklin was then convicted on that DNA evidence. So this case started with a series of murders, a hiatus of no murders and a series of other murders. And then familial DNA led them to the killer's son, which then led them to obtain DNA from the killer and get the conviction. Similar cases have happened uh, around and there's others. When you go to my website, you'll see the links uh, for the, for the, what I call the, the notes, the, uh, um, and you'll be able to see links for all of these things for the case notes on, on this on this talk, and uh, you you can look at all these cases. But let's talk about a very famous case, Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. Well, it turned out in the late seventies and early eighties, a lot of prostitutes were disappearing, and their bodies were being found often months or years later in the Green River area uh, near Seattle, Tacoma. Um, and so the killer was dubbed the Green River Killer. Many, uh, many, many murders took, took place there and many remains were found. The police, as they investigated these bodies, most of the remains were skeletal. Few had any tissue left because it's uh, so long passed between the murders and the corpses being discovered. And they were in such a remote area uh, that they they didn't have much to work with. But a couple of the cases revealed at least some semen samples. And therefore, uh, they were able to 
to take those samples. Now remember, this is 79 to 81 in that range. There was no DNA. Uh, Al, uh, Sir Alec Jeffries had not figured it out. That was going to come four or five years later. It had not entered the courtroom or been used in a case that was going to happen with the Colin Pitchfork and the, the Spencer case I talked about earlier. Uh, so we didn't have all that, but there was blood typing and all of that. So they, they collected these samples. So we flash forward to about 1987 and Gary Ridgway was uh, developed as one of the many s uh, possible suspects in this. Um, a van like his that had uh, a primer uh, fender was seen, one of the prostitutes that later disappeared was seen getting into it, that kind of thing, or one similar to it. And so to make a long story short, they, uh, they visited Gary and uh, got a search warrant. And somebody was smart enough not to just search his his place in his car and his van and all that stuff. But somebody, at least in the search warrant, decided they wanted biological evidence. So they did a swab of his saliva and they got his DNA, they got his evidence there. So rem this is just about the time DNA was entering the, the courtroom. But the problem then is that the techniques used at that time required a fairly large sample. And the two crime scene samples were very small uh, not much uh, DNA, um, and in order to make a comparison against someone, they would basically consume all the samples. Uh, the investigators really thought Ridgway was the guy, but they needed to prove it. And uh, if they were wrong, then all that, that biological evidence was gone. So they waited. Well, flash forward, things like PCR, Polymer, the polymerase chain reaction, and STR, short tandem repeat analysis. The things that we know now work very well for DNA, and you can take tiny samples, theoretically a single cell, and produce all the DNA you need for, for comparison. So they waited, and just after the turn of the millennium in 2001, they finally decided it's time. We have this new technique. We can make all the DNA from the samples we want, and we can compare it. And they compared it to Gary Ridgway, and indeed it matched. An interesting side note along this is that in, in about 1984, Ted Bundy told him, said, he said, I know how to, I know how to help you find this guy. He called him the river man. And, and so they sent, the FBI sent agents down there to talk to him, and, and they, he basically said, uh, you know, stake out the bodies when you find them, if you find a fresh body, because he's probably revisiting them. Well, it turns out that that actually is what Ridgway was doing, but it didn't really help because uh, the bodies were not discovered for months or years after the murders. So it, Gary was finished with them, as it were, by then. So um, it never worked out, but I thought it was an interesting aside there. Ultimately, I think they, they don't know how many people Gary Gary Ridgway killed. Uh, you know, it's in the 70s. Some people say it could be over 100. But at the end of the day, he um, he uh, confessed to 49 and uh, is in prison. And, and there's that. Let's look at a couple of unusual cases. There's a French jewel thief known as Pierre G. That's the only name that they give out. And it's kind of interesting. This guy and his accomplice followed a 56-year-old uh, woman who was an employee of a jewelry store in Paris to her home. And there they, de they detained her. They bound her to a chair. They gagged her. And they poured something over that they said was gasoline. And that if she made a fuss, that set her on fire. Pretty scary stuff. So they forced her to give up the codes for the security system at the jewelry store. One of them stayed there with her. The other one went to the jewelry store, cleaned it out, came back. They cut her loose and they left. But Pierre G. planted a kiss on her cheek. Uh, maybe a sign of that, you know, he felt sorry for her, that it had put her through all this, and oh, it was awful. But for whatever reason, he gave her a little kiss on the cheek on the way out the door. Well, what, the police were called, a forensic team arrived, she told them the story, they swabbed her cheek, they got uh, a DNA uh, profile, and a few months later, uh, the DNA matched a man who.
who they only described as uh, as Pierre G. And they found him in, in prison where he had been arrested on suspicion of other thefts. And so that case was solved by DNA in a kiss. Another interesting case was that of David Stoddard. And this, is, this took place in Ohio. He's a 24-year-old guy who uh, allegedly shot and killed a pregnant 16-year-old girl. But prior to that, he had been a part of a crew of three masked men that had broken into a house maybe three months earlier and robbed a woman and her son. Well, the family had a dog that was a pit bull mix, and it bit Stoddard on the arm. And the dog was shot and killed right there. And then they took their, their booty and they left. Well, an officer saw this as an opportunity, and he swabbed the dog's mouth and obtained a DNA sample. And so now they had this on file. So later, when Stoddard was arrested for the murder of 16-year-old Jessica Hallman, and they connected his DNA, they connected it back to this home invasion-type robbery. So they solved the robbery based on the DNA obtained from the dog's mouth. So maybe you can use this in a story. So the dog bit, bit him. He got some blood and tissue on, on his mouth and, and, and lips and what they swabbed it. They got the DNA. And later when they arrested him for another crime, obviously a much worse crime, but they, they traced it back to this one was able to solve that one. Another case, um, that was just reported in 2013, uh, in the journal of forensic science, uh, there's no names involved, but apparently a, baddie, a badly burned body was discovered, uh, and it was burned beyond recognition. So they could, there was no way to identify who the person was, though they thought they knew who this person was. Um, but the face and the neck of the of the corpse was um, was filled with lar fly larvae. They had come in and laid their eggs and colonized the thing, were feeding on corpses as flies want to do. So what they did is they collected the maggots and they took their stomach contents and did profiles. And then they compared that against to the father of the suspected victim. And they came back with a probability of paternity uh, nearly 100 percent, 99 plus, plus, plus. So they were able to identify who these remains were, though they suspected they were able to prove it fairly conclusively by using the stomach contents of maggots. Well, you can use that. And then there's the fascinating and odd case of, <laughs> of Willow Martin. Willow Martin's a 19-year-old who uh, was a stripper, and she was best friends with this other stripper named Briona Constantino. Well, it seems that um, Willow loaned Briano uh, $1,200 for some clothing and other stuff. But Constantino was slow to repay the debt, and uh, Willow Martin became angry. Now, she had anger issues. <laughs> she had been known to say, I'll burn their shit down. And in fact, they believed that she actually set fire to her mother's house because she got mad at her once. So, lo and behold, when the MTM Masonry Company caught on fire and the Chinese restaurant next door to it also caught on fire, um, needless to say, this launched an arson investigation by the police. Well, the Masonry Company was actually owned by Brianna Constantino's stepfather. And so Martin had apparently targeted it to get back at Constantino for not repaying the debt. It's amazing what will motivate people to do crazy stuff. So, how does DNA enter this? Well, it turns out that um, Martin had uh, an accomplice. Her boyfriend, a guy named Matthew Gar Gargillo. Well, Matthew went along on this, apparently. And for some reason, shoved a potato into the tailpipe 
of the uh, van at the masonry business. Uh, I assume it was to keep them if they somebody saw them and came after them to keep them from chasing him, or maybe they were just trying to be cute. The old banana and a tailpipe thing from, uh, what was that? 48 hours, Eddie Murphy. Uh, but whatever, he decided to shove this, uh, potato in the tailpipe to ho hopefully make this vehicle vapor lock either as a escape mechanism or to be mischievous. Well, the police collected the potato they swabbed it for DNA. They found Gargillo's DNA on there, proving that he was there. He was the one that put the potato in the tailpipe. And he finally confessed and said, whoa, 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 I was there, but um, Willow did all this. And so she was ultimately convicted and got eight years. Strange, strange, strange. So, like I said, if you go to the show notes on, on all of this, you'll see uh, links to all of these cases where you can learn about them in detail. But I think the take home message here is that DNA is an incredible tool. It's, um, it has progressed so much in the last 30, 40 years that it's, it's not, it's not even near what it was. If you go back to Colin Pitchfork with a, with a, with the testing of uh, groups of people. Well, one of the ways to get around that was the development of CODIS, uh, the combined DNA system that the FBI runs where D DNA, uh, DNA uh, profiles of criminals are, are, are put on file and you can connect them against databases. That's kind of like uh, doing a whole village. It just happens to be tens of millions of people. Um, better techniques for, for testing DNA. Uh, more sensitive, more accurate, faster. Uh, DNA can be done very quickly now. It can be obtained from fingerprints. It can be obtained from a single hair. It can be obtained from a single cell, which in, raises other questions. If someone just walks through a crime scene, they can shed cells, and suddenly their DNA is there at the crime scene. And this could have happened days earlier, and they may have nothing to do with the crime but they have contaminated it, as it were, simply by dropping skin cells or by touching something at the scene. And lo and behold, your DNA is there and you better have an explanation. So DNA is a wonderful tool, but remember, it just connects. It, it, it just connects um, one person to another person, one person to an object, one person to a place. And then from that, it has to... Um, the police have to then make that connection. Uh, what does this mean? And then the courts have to investigate, have to try that and determine if this connection is criminal. Uh, just because someone's DNA is present does not mean that they did the deed. But as you can see in these cases, it does bring suspects and victims and suspects and objects like potatoes and suspects and locations like uh, the brown chicken uh, restaurant uh, together. And then they have to have an explanation for why it's there. So, like I said, there's a lot more about DNA in both Forensics for Dummies and How Done It Forensics. Uh, there's some links that on the show notes uh, that you can do further investigation on all of this. And uh, DNA is a huge topic. Uh, in my last show, I talked about how much harder it is to write, uh, crime fiction now than it, than it used to be. And one of these is because of these types of things. Um, your killer can't just put his fingers everywhere and, and, you know, and kiss someone on the cheek or shove a potato in a tailpipe and expect to get away with it. So until next time, this has been DP Lyle. This is criminal mischief, the art and science of crime fiction. I hope this was fun. I hope it was helpful. I hope you learned something. Until next time, thanks.